Okay, this lecture is a little bit short. We just have one key idea here at the beginning that I want to address and talk about for a couple minutes, and then we're going to look at our understanding of the bilaterian ancestor. Okay, so first off, let's talk about conserved biochemical function. So basically what this means, it's fancy words, but when you break it down, it's not too complicated. Basically, we mean when we have two genes that are homologs, and found in very distantly related organisms, and they have the exact same, or at least very, very similar function, right? So this is an example of deep homology in some cases, because we may not even recognize homology of structures until we find this genetic connection. So eyes are a great example. Uh, vertebrates have a complex eye. So do arthropods, so do mollusks. But those three types of eyes are very, very different from one another. And originally, based on those differences, biologists thought that they had evolved completely independently, that although they all sensed light, they didn't have a common ancestral connection. But yet, once we started to explore the genetic underpinnings of this structure, how they first are grown from the pluripotent cells in the developing embryo, we discovered that the exact same gene is used. Not only that, but when I take a gene out of a mouse and put it into a fruit fly that is deficient for that gene, that mouse gene can basically substitute for the fruit fly gene. So that's an incredibly conserved biochemical function. That's 500, 600 million years of evolution that separates those two organisms, yet that gene is still able to be swapped from one to the other. So the question is, why is there so much constraint? And I've listed the two main reasons here. And we could probably make some subcategories or maybe find even some other minor reasons. But these are the two big ones, and you should know these. So the first is maybe obvious. These genes have a critical function. So mutations in the past that changed the function of those genes were not advantageous. So they were never kept. So even though lots and lots of mutations have occurred, natural selection has weeded out the vast majority of those, at least the ones that had a functional impact on these genes. And so these genes maintain their functional integrity across hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Okay? Number two, of course, is pleiotropy. And pleiotropy is a phenomenon that increases the constraint that we have on a gene. So remember, pleiotropy is where one gene has two or three or four different functions. And nearly all developmental genes, certainly all the Hox genes, are pleiotropic. They might do one thing in early development, another thing in mid-development. Some of them even have a later function post-development. So when you have a job that has three or four or five functions, changes to it are going to be much, much less likely to have an impact. And again, this is remember why, well, remember, this is why much of the evolution and changes that we see in developmental networks are to the regulation of those networks because the genes don't have much room to change without having a drastic effect on many uh, downstream phenotypes. Okay, so both of those are very good reasons why we might see so much constraint even over hundreds of millions of years. And the PAC6 eyeless example, those, that's the name of the gene that develops the eye in mice and then in uh, fruit flies. That's a little bit of an extreme example. Not all homologs can be swapped in and out like that, but still there are remarkable levels of conservation. Okay? So one little follow-up. What is the impact of gene duplication on the constraint of genes? So think about this. Let's say we've got an important developmental gene, and it's pleiotropic. It has four jobs. But then we get a mutation, and we have a duplicated version of that. Would that increase or decrease the evolutionary constraint on that gene? Now, hopefully in your head you're thinking, okay, well, we've got redundancy. Redundancy is related, but not directly to what we're talking about. But rem remember that when we've got two things, then one of them could change, and you still have that other gene there to do the original job. So then we could release some of that pleiotropic constraint, and uh, we could evolve and change one of those genes. So gene duplication if it occurs in a pleiotropic gene, tends to release constraint and then free them up to evolve and explore some more of the adaptive landscape that might be beneficial. Okay, So just those key ideas, review them, make sure you understand why we see so much constraint on some of these uh, developmental genes. All right, so now let's take a look. Oh, sorry, here's our eyeless example, right? 
So this primitive eye, again, this is an example of deep homology. Pac-6 or eyeless was present in the ancestor of all the bilaterians. And originally we didn't think that, right? So we thought the vertebrate cephalochordates and uricordates, which uricordates don't have eyes, but yet they express Pac-6. They have some light photosensitive areas. Um, same thing with cephalochordates. But, um, so it's expressed in all of them, but in some of them, arthropods especially, on a cough are a little less so, but we do have eyes, some of them very complex evolved eyes. And once we knew that, found that gene, that connection helped us to establish the homology of these structures, okay? So what did the ancestor of all bilaterians look like? Now, some of these we can infer from the fossil record, but that's really tricky because the first really good extensive fossil record we have for bilaterians is during the Cambrian explosion. About 525 to 540 million years ago, we get this rapid appearance of all of the major lineages of um, bilaterians in the fossil record. Um, and we don't have a really good representation prior to that. So what we can do though, but we could do this with living species. So although the fossil record is important, it doesn't provide that much extra from just the diversity we see in living species. Because what we can do is we can look across a phylogeny and we can map different characters onto a phylogeny. When we do that, we know where those features evolved ancestrally. And once we have the genetic features, like the presence of this PAC-6 gene, we can map that on there also, okay? So most of these come from this, this mapping of characteristics in both the fossil record and in modern organisms and trying to infer what ancestor they originated in, okay? So a couple of major things. The first, that the ancestor of all bilaterians already had a very clear anterior to posterior axis, meaning their head was different from their tail, and a dorsal to ventral axis. Now, of course, bilateral differentiation also, that's where their name comes from. But the head, the tail, and the dorsal to ventral sites were very, very well defined early on in the ancestor of all bilaterians. And these are some of the genes that play a role in that. We've talked about some of them, but you don't need to memorize things um, other than what we talked about in class previously. Three other items. One, they have a regionalized central nervous system. So when I say regionalized, what that means is the anterior part of the central nervous system is different than the posterior part. It's most obvious in higher vertebrates, of course, where our brain is very, very complex and uh, one of the reasons why we're so successful. And then our, the rest of our spinal column is pretty much you know, similar, a little bit of difference, but not much once you get past the brain. Okay? But in other organisms, it's not quite as pronounced, but it still is, is there. Okay? The ancestor of all bilaterians was segmented, and we see that still very strongly and externally in most bilaterians today. So arthropods, we see it. Annelids, we see it. Uh, to some extent, we even see it in mollusks and vertebrates, although it's less apparent. Uh, some stages of life, you see it a little bit more, but we can see it in the internal morphology of vertebrates. And then number four, a regionalized gut. Same thing as the central nervous system. Our foregut, right, is different than our midgut, and that's different than our hindgut. Now, generally, the foregut is for the processing and movement of food into the digestive center system. The midgut is for breaking down and absorption of nutrients, right? So that's your stomach, your small intestine, that's your midgut. And your hindgut, which includes your large, large intestine, your colon, is primarily for maintaining um, water balance so that we can absorb water from our gut. We can put it in if we need to, to flush things out. So that hindgut is primarily for osmoregularity and water balance, okay? But this was present in the common bilaterian ancestor, okay? We know now, and this is an example of deep homology, we didn't know this until we started looking at the genes, and that's deep homology. So remember, it's homology that was not recognized until we were able to identify and look at the genes that build those structures, okay? So we had a photoreceptor. Now notice I didn't say I because although PAC-6 and PAC-6's is expression is common across the bilaterians, not all of them have fully formed eyes, but they do have some photosensitivity. Okay, so photoreceptor, a very primitive one. Then later that evolves and gets more elaborate, becomes the arthropod eye, becomes the vertebrate eye, and becomes the uh, other groups, but the uh, mollusks are another really great example. Body wall outgrowths, and again, I've been, 
on purpose, I've been a little bit vague here. This you could say an appendage, right? Legs, arms, tentacles, all of those things, tube feet even in um, echinoderms are all thought to have evolved from this common, fairly simple ancestral appendage or body wall outgrowth. And again, this is another great example of deep homology with the gene distalis, which is responsible for the initiation of everything from fruit fly legs to vertebrate arms to tube feet and echinoderms to antenna, every, all of these things are started by distalis. So another great example of um, deep homology and a very clear example of a feature that was in the ancestor of all of these bilaterians. Circulatory pump, which is a heart, and that, that, that's maybe a little bit more vague than we need to. You could say heart, although depending on how you define heart and how complex it needs to be before you call it a heart, if you just have a vessel that pulses without any clear differences uh, in chambers, it may not really fall under, under some people's definition of heart. But some hearts are just very simple with very little connection to the circulatory system, and others are much more complex with closed circulatory systems like we have in, in uh, the higher vertebrates. Okay? So you don't need to memorize all of those, but you know it's pretty simple and straightforward. And so make sure you know at least three or four, and you may see an example on a test where I ask you an essay question, say list three or four um, characteristics that the bilaterian ancestor had, and then tell me how we know. And the short answer how we know is, well, we look across the diversity of living organisms and fossil organisms, then we map those characters, maybe gene characters even, but we map those characters onto a phylogeny and determine where they originated. Okay, so here we go. As toolkits get bigger, we get all this diversity that we see in the arthropods and the higher vertebrates, and you see those uh, elaboration of the genetics that then allow for an elaboration of the morphology also, okay? And so today we can look at these genes. This is just a distalist example. So here we have Anacophora, distalist being expressed in the antenna, here in the mouth parts, in every single leg. Here we have a um, annelid, a segmented worm, and distalist being expressed in all of these segments, even when we have different structures growing, these appendage-like segments. This is an echinoderm larva, so in echinoderm we have it. Um, this is in a developing mouse larva, right, or mouse embryo right here. So anyway, just know distalis, know that Eilis and Pac-6 example is a great examples of deep homology, and make sure you review and know the definition of deep homology.